Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Matthew Spalding, Associate Vice President and Dean of Educational Programs for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Welcome for Allen B. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship. Hillsdale College was founded in 1844 by men and women believing that the diffusion of learning is essential to uh, the perpetuity of the blessings of civil and religious liberty. Uh, we take learning and those liberties very seriously. It was George Washington in his great 1790 letter to the Newport congregation, Jewish congregation in Newport, Rhode Island, uh, the Jewish people being one of the most persecuted peoples in history, who reminded us that Americans enjoy their religious liberty not as a matter of toleration, but as an exercise of inherent right, bound up in man's very nature. Uh, in rapidly changing times like these, uh, we were reminded how important it is to secure and strengthen our first freedom. We're very pleased to have our speaker with us here today. Uh, he'll be introduced by one of our students. Sarah Onken is from Seymour, Indiana. She's a junior at Hillsdale College, where she is a politics and math double major. Uh, she is a George Washington Fellow and currently interning at the Heritage Foundation. Sarah. Thank you, Dr. Spalding. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. As a born and raised Hoosier, I am very interested in our speaker's talk this afternoon on the war in Indiana. Many of my friends, family members, classmates, and professors fiercely debated the controversy over Indiana's Religious Freedom and Restoration Act and left some of us irritably divided. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. David French to explain this issue and outline what it means for religious liberty in Indiana and our country. David French is an attorney, writer, and veteran of the Iraq War. He is a graduate of Harvard Law School, the past president of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, and former lecturer at Cornell Law School. His legal work defending religious liberty on college campuses helped inspire the 2014 hit movie, God's Not Dead. A writer with National Review, Mr. French is also the author and co-author of several books, including A Season for Justice, Defending the Rights of the Christian Home, Church, and School, and Rise of Isis, A Threat We Can't Ignore, a New York Times number one bestseller. He contributes regular, regularly to Pathos, and his work has also appeared in the Washington Post, Washington Times, and Human Events. French has appeared on ABC World News Tonight, CNN Newsroom, and Special Report with Britt Hume. A regular guest on radio talk show programs, Brett French has been interviewed with National Public Radio and by numerous hosts, including Michael Medved, Hugh Hewitt, and Dennis Prager. Mr. French is a major of the U.S. Army Reserve. In 2007, he deployed to Iraq as a squadron judge advocate for the 2nd Squadron 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and he was awarded the Bronze Star at the conclusion of his tour. He lives in Columbia, Tennessee with his wife, Nancy, and their three children. So please join me in welcoming Mr. David French. Thank you very much. And uh, first, I want to thank the uh, Kirby Center in Hillsdale for inviting me. It's a real honor to speak on this topic, especially to folks in the audience who, just looking at the audience I know, could deliver an extended and better lecture on this subject than I can. Uh, I want to begin where uh, most discussions of important cultural issues should begin, and that is with a uh, Michael Bay and Jerry Bruckheimer movie. Uh, some of you may remember this one, a classic called Armageddon. Armageddon, if you forget the premise, was that uh, the world discovers that it is about to end. I think that's the premise for most Michael Bay and Jerry Bruckheimer movies. And it's going to end at the hands of a gigantic asteroid or meteorite that is hurtling towards the Earth and will create a cataclysmic, cataclysmic extinction level event. The only way to stop it is to send a group of deep core drillers, oil wildcatters, out to space, led, of course, by Bruce Willis, to drill through the asteroid, plant a nuclear bomb, detonate the asteroid, and come home to safety and a hero's welcome. Fantastic film. And the reason why it applies is I was trying to think of an analogy for how the culture war over religious liberty is shaking out. And I couldn't think of a better analogy than the process of mining. And the most vivid movie I can ever remember about mining was Armageddon. Now, if you remember it, and no doubt you do, 
They, hand, they landed on an asteroid in horrific conditions after enduring many troubles, and they begin the process of mining. They feel like they're home free. They are cutting through soft rock for minutes, for hours. They're on schedule. And then what happens? They hit some kind of hard space rock. Their drill bits break. Chaos occurs. People die. And at the very end of it, Bruce Willis has to sacrifice himself to save the world. What does that have to do with the religious liberty? All right. I would submit to you that for some time, the left, in making progress in damaging religious liberty in this country, has been drilling through an awful lot of soft rock. It has been going through a public that is largely unengaged at church, uh, largely uninformed about the reason for their values, heavily swayed by pop culture, and ready to receive a message that is simple, that is compelling, and that casts a certain group of people in white hats and a certain group of people in black hats, easily susceptible to things like race analogies, easily susceptible to changes in perception by viewing, for example, sitcoms. Uh, how often has anyone heard that one of the most important developments for gay rights in the United States was the sitcom Will and Grace? I would submit to you that if a sitcom is changing your worldview, you are soft rock. So in where I live in the South, a soft rock is limestone. Limestone is, uh, crumbles easily, drilled through easily. But then sometimes when you're drilling, you hit granite. You hit hard rock. And I, would, I believe that the reason for the intensity of the Battle of Indiana, which is only one of many battles, is because the soft rock has been stripped away and the cultural left is now encountering the granite of the base of the cultural right, and it is not making progress. So if I could say, if there would be one sort of subtitle to this talk, it would be against despair. The soft rock has been stripped away, the granite remains, and now they are the ones who are carrying the baggage of an easily swayed sitcom watching, uh, sitcom influenced, population, whereas we are now increasingly paring down to a base million strong of people who are not willing to budge on core issues, not willing to budge at all, and in fact are willing to push back and push back decisively. So I didn't look at Indiana the way many people looked at Indiana as a defeat for cultural conservatism. Unquestionably, there was an element of political defeat. Uh, Governor Pence uh, and and Indiana Republicans revised the statute post haste uh, to try to deal with uh, popular objections that really had very little basis in law or fact. Uh, so to the left declared victory. They'd won a political battle there. They had won what appeared to them to be a PR battle. But there were deeper realities there that I'm going to talk about. So here are four truths that I think are emerging as a result of the Battle of Indiana and many other battles that have gone before and the battles that will come after. First, this is not a battle between, quote, gay rights and religious liberty. It's just not. Uh, it is a battle between the sexual revolution and Orthodox Christianity. Now, I would also include other religions as well, uh, Judaism, Islam, but the focus of the battle, the focus is on the Christian community. So it's a battle of sexual revolution versus Orthodox Christianity. Second, because increasingly Christian thinkers and the larger Christian public is realizing that, Orthodox denominations and Orthodox, Orthodox sectors, small o, of course, when I'm using the term Orthodox, are not looking to revise or amend or change their policies and their practices and their theology surrounding sexual revolution issues. They're not. Name one major American denomination that you would consider evangelical or orthodox that is thinking about revising, for example, or seriously debating revising whether or not it's going to recognize same-sex marriages or revising whether or not it's going to support abortion on demand. There's not one. It's not on the horizon. Third, in part because of this, Rather than retreat, retreating quietly, 
cultural conservatism is showing an enormous amount of strength at the grassroots level, not at the pop culture level, not in the level of the mainstream media, not in, in major coastal cities, but at the grassroots level, it is showing an enormous amount of strength. And fourth, and this is vitally important as well, the intellectual backbone of the conservative movement in the United States is not wavering on these key issues. From the folks at the highest perches, for example, Ross Douthat at the New York Times, to folks at, to, to those who are writing broadly about it at multiple other uh, publications, you are seeing an enormous amount of unanimity that's what is happening, for example, in Indiana, what has happened to Hobby Lobby, what has happened to Chick-fil-A, what has happened to Brenda, with Brendan Eich, a large degree of consensus amongst significant thinkers in the conservative movement and in the Christian movement more broadly that this is wrong, this is bad. Now, you'll have a lot of divergence as to whether or not doom is upon us. Uh, there's, a, I think, an emerging consensus often that doom is upon us. There's a word that Rod Dreher has mentioned, several, or a phrase he's mentioned, is the Benedict option. Uh, a strategic retreat from the culture. Uh, I disagree with that, and I'll discuss that in a little bit. But I believe those four principles are in play. Now, the good news means, with those four principles in play, defeat for those who are interested in religious liberty and advocate for religious liberty is not imminent. Here's the bad news. Neither is victory. I... Uh, I hesitate to use war analogies because what we have here, thankfully, in the United States is not religious war. It's not. I mean, and, and I especially hesitate to use war analogies and, and persecution analogies, given the fact that what's happening overseas is horrifying on a scale that dwarfs anything that we're experiencing as a result of, the, uh, of, of battles like Indiana or fights like Hobby Lobby endured. You can't really compare those two. But having said that, I'm going to go ahead and use a war analogy because they can be vivid and instructive. I think what we're beginning to go into is a period of, what, of trench warfare, of essential stalemate, where the two bases clash with each other again and again with not necessarily persuading each other at stake, but persuading the softer middle, that limestone that I talked about to mix the metaphors. So before I dive deeper into those four truths, let me just set the stage for this battle of Indiana. Now, for almost everyone in here, this is going to be old hat. So you can tune out, uh, you can check your uh, iPhone quickly and surreptitiously if you want. But let's just get some truth into this debate about Indiana specifically. Indiana's law, its version of the Religious Freedom Restoration Act was not in any way, shape, or form an attempt to reimpose Jim Crow, nor was it an attempt to transform, to create a Jim Crow-like regime for gay and lesbian citizens of Indiana. It was not. It was a law very much like the, a law that existed that time in 19 other states and the United States uh, government that said that you can't quite simply, that if there's a substantial burden on your religious liberty, that burden cannot be overcome by a state action unless it's justified by compelling government interest accomplished with the least restrictive means. That's a legal test. It established a legal test. Nothing more, nothing less. Now, it just so happened to establish a legal test that, that did not fall out of the clear blue sky. It is a legal test that has existed for generations in American law, in generations applied specifically to religious liberty, and it's a legal test that existed simultaneously, and this is very important to note, with the explosive growth of non-discrimination statutes in the United States. That legal test comes from the Supreme Court of the United States, which at the same time that the court was expanding its protection and expanding, uh, was, was pioneering constitutional doctrine and upholding protections against race discrimination, it was also implementing a test for the, for the free exercise clause of the First Amendment that was the compelling governmental interest test. Those two tests, or those two legal developments existed side by side. On the one hand, if you're gonna infringe on religious liberty, you had to justify it with a compelling governmental interest through the least restrictive means. On the other hand, we were in the United States enacting huge numbers of public accommodation statutes, non-discrimination statutes at the federal and at the state level. 
And in fact, the Supreme Court in 1968, actually in a footnote, talked about a conflict, claimed conflict, between religious liberty and a public accommodation statute that prohibited discrimination on the basis of state, uh, on the basis of race. And declared in that case, Newman versus Piggy Park Enterprises, 1968, that a Business owners claim that the, their decision to exclude African Americans from their business was justified by their faith was, quote, patently frivolous. That's the actual phrase that the Supreme Court used, patently frivolous. So if anyone says that the, uh, the compelling governmental interest standard supports and protects Jim Crow, Jim Crow well, asked and answered. Asked and answered. Now, what, what was at stake in Indiana? It was not the ability to engage in class-based discrimination, but rather the creation of a legal test that on a case-by-case -case basis could potentially protect religious liberty in circumstances that are not acceptable to one or other side of the political spectrum. Uh, in the example of Indiana, which caused an enormous amount of controversy, that test would involve, say, for example, a uh, a decision to not provide uh, a wedding, or well, let, let me be precise to Indiana, a pizza, not provide a pizza to a wedding reception uh, for a same-sex marriage, even though, for example, that uh, pizza owner would be happy to provide pizza to a wedding of a gay man if the man were marrying a woman. Uh, so there was not class-based discrimination. It was an unwillingness to participate uh, or to cooperate in to facilitate a, cer a ceremony that the pizza owner, the, the pizzeria owner found to be objectionable. So that's one kind of situation where RIFRA could be raised as a defense. It would not necessarily decide the outcome of the case. The outcome of the case would depend on the application of the legal test. Was there a compelling governmental interest to override the pizza owner's conscience? If there was, was it supported? Uh, was it accomplished through the least restrictive means? And anyone who thinks that a case under that test on those facts is a foregone conclusion as to how it would come out is not familiar with the practice of law in state or federal court in this country. Legal tests do not provide automatic outcomes. They just don't. Now, on the other hand, uh, when many people on the left really liked RIFRAs, it involved such more, uh, more exotic religious practices, such as, for example, smoking peyote. And in fact, smoking peyote was the, the right to smoke peyote in a religious ritual was the motivation for the first and grandest RIFRA. Um, the Supreme Court of the United States struck, struck down or reversed itself on its compelling governmental interest standard when it received a case from a, a person who sought the right to smoke peyote in a religious ritual. And just in, in the Supreme Court, in a highly controversial decision of the time, said, you know what, we're going to change our test. We're going to essentially say a religious liberty claim fails if it collides with a neutral law of general applicability, which pretty much swallowed the free exercise clause. And so the, there was a bipartisan reaction to that decision that resulted in the National Religious Freedom Restoration Act that reimposed that test originally on both state and federal laws, but the Supreme Court narrowed it down to just federal laws, and that was what was at issue with the Hobby Lobby cases. So this was about a legal test. It was not about Jim Crow, and it was not about guaranteeing that a Christian baker or florist could refuse to serve a gay wedding, because not even the architects of the bill could say that that's what would occur. That would have been up to a court. But it was this was about much more than the facts. This was about symbols. It was about the symbolism of the sexual revolution possibly, maybe, facing a small legal and political reverse. Small one. Because let's just face it, how many bakers and florists have refused to serve in gay weddings or photographers? I think I can count four to five. Last time I counted, I think the population of this country is about 310, 315 million. So to say that this would be a significant reverse for sexual revolution if four to five people might, could possibly win a case in refusing to participate in a same-sex wedding, 
that's sheer fantasy. But symbols matter, and symbols were important. And so the Battle of Indiana was launched. And here is where I think the debate has begun to change in my professional life. My first, the first time I ever worked on a religious liberty case uh, was I was a, a 1L at Harvard Law School. It was the fall of 1991. I was incredibly excited that a lawyer had asked me to proofread a brief filed in a case, and this, this is maybe the greatest case name ever. I can't even remember the, uh, uh, the, the plaintiff's name, but the defendant was Hot, Sexy, and Safer Productions, okay? The facts of the case were pretty amazing, and in this Hot, Sexy, and Safer case, uh, some students were required to attend a student assembly, and at that student assembly, this was high school, uh, there were people engaged in simulated sex acts on stage who urged... Um, who, who urged students to experiment sexually. They placed uh, um, condoms onto bananas. They did all kinds of things that you've heard about in other cases and other places. And some Christian students objected to this, and one of them tried to stand up to leave, and he was physically pushed down into his seat by a school official, physically pushed down and made to continue to watch this. So they filed a claim, uh, and I thought, wow, outrageous. America will rise up in anger at this violation of individual liberty. The courts will be outraged. And the case received approximately no press attention, and the student's case went down in flames. Uh, lost at the trial court, lost in the First Circuit, and to this day, as far as I know, is good law. You can require students to attend these assemblies, witness these events that are morally objectionable to large numbers of the students, and they may not leave. They may not, they're not constitutionally entitled to leave. So then I continued on in my uh, practice, and in the year 2000, I had an interesting case at Tufts University. This was one of my first cases uh, when I had I'd left the work of the large law firm. I was a lecturer at Cornell Law School at the time, and a friend of a friend called and said, I have a problem at Tufts University. What's the problem? My student group got thrown off campus in an emergency meeting of the student uh, conduct board. Why? Well, it turns out that uh, we would not let an openly lesbian woman become president of the organization. And I thought, and you've been thrown out on an emergency meeting? What was the emergency? Follow this logic. The Student Conduct Board met and decided that Christianity teaches there is such a thing as sin. You following me so far? Sin leads to feelings a sense of sin leads to feelings of guilt. Okay, you with me? Guilt leads to feelings of shame, including deep shame. And shame leads to, who wants to fill in the last blank? Suicide. So, to protect the campus from suicide, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Tufts University had to be thrown off campus post haste. So I got involved in that case. In that case, by at least what I thought as a young, much younger lawyer, uh, exploded in the media. And I thought, well, this is a turning point. Now Americans will realize there is a problem that we're facing with religious liberty if a Christian student group cannot decide that it will be led by a Christian. That's a problem. Uh, mainstream media covered it, NPR covered it, everybody covered it. I thought this is a fantastic turning point. Eventually, the Student Conduct Board reversed itself, allowed InterVarsity back on campus. And in my naive younger days, I thought, well, what a tremendous victory. And I was right. It was a victory for the other side. Because all of a sudden, campuses around the country said, oh, I have an idea. Let's get rid of, let's go on a search and destroy mission for organizations like InterVarsity that have similar policies. And my friend Kim Colby and I have been fighting this for a very long time. And we put together a list recently. And this is cases that just Kim or I have been involved in. And I, I stopped counting at 35 states and more than 100 individual institutions that have faced uh, where Christian student groups have either been excluded from campus or threatened with exclusion because they wanted leadership to be Christian. So the battles kept going, and I could go through fact scenario after fact scenario after fact scenario where 
again and again, I would believe if I pounded the table enough, if we yelled loudly enough, if we put the right kind of, of industry and attention into this issue, then finally the base of conservatism, the base of Christian conservatism, the base of faithful Christians would understand the stakes and begin to respond. Little did I know that it wouldn't, that going after campus Christians wasn't the straw that would break the camel's back. Going after elementary school children wasn't the straw that would break the camel's back. Silencing chaplains wasn't the straw that would break the camel's back. I could go on and on. The straw that would break the camel's back is when they came for our chicken sandwiches. When Chick-fil-A faced the wrath of the so-called social justice warriors, all of a sudden, the sleeping giant awoke. Now, I think that that was an important lesson for those of us who deal with the public day in, day out on these issues, is that we're really kind of not that big a deal. We can have 50 million talking head appearances, write 1,700 op-eds, and talk about this day in, day out, but there's nothing more powerful than a good meal to really motivate people. And so there was the largest anti-sexual revolution grassroots movement I've ever seen in my life and may ever see when hundreds of Chick-fil-A stores across the country sold out of their chicken. Never heard of a restaurant selling out of its food. Uh, my wife went to the Bicot in our local town and there was so much traffic that the police officer was directing it with a big Chick-fil-A cup in his hand <laughs> to make sure that there wasn't a traffic jam in Columbia, Tennessee, which would have been the first ever non-Mule Day related traffic jam in Columbia history. And yes, we have a Mule Day. Every local politician was there joining in, me too, me too, I'm for Chick-fil-A. It was an astonishing cultural moment. And, but it was also a valuable cultural moment because it began to penetrate into the popular mind of the Christian community, uh, the conservative community more broadly in this country that there's something serious going on here. And that's why when I say uh, it's not gay rights versus relig religious liberty, it's dawning on people this is sexual revolution versus Christianity. Because if you'll note, every time there is a major, uh, a, a major confrontation, pop culture confrontation on these things, the left narrows the issue. So Wendy Davis filibusters, and she is the queen of, uh, of defending the right to choose well, then it's all about this very narrow issue of the state legislature intruding on women's bodies. Hobby Lobby gets involved in a massive confrontation leading to an own, its own attempted and utterly failed boycott from the left against Hobby Lobby. And there it's about, it's not about a larger sweeping thing, it's about can women get contraceptives? In Indiana, it's not about anything bigger and sweeper, it's about this gay, very specific gay rights versus religious liberty are you going to mistreat this gay couple who wants to get married? So again and again, the focus is, let's make this small. What, why are you doing this discreet action that hurts women or denies contraceptives or denies a gay couple the pizza they so desperately want at their reception? This discreet action. But the larger Christian community is beginning to understand this is linked. This is absolutely linked. It's about an overriding worldview that is not biblical. It is anti-biblical. And that folding on one element of it requires, by theological logic, folding on every element of it. I would urge you guys to read uh, in The Atlantic, Ross Douthat has a, a piece about Pope Francis, and he talks about how the Catholic Church is facing right now this question about what to do with couples who are married and divorced. Uh, I mean, divorced and remarried. And that on the one side, there's an argument that it's a very discreet decision that you can, uh, you can uh, grant communion to a remarried couple without doing violence to the larger structure of Catholic theology on sexuality. And then on the other side is, a, uh, is the argument that this is part of a seamless whole. And that if you tear away one part of it, the theological logic there is so relentless, you'll tear away the rest. And that argument is winning the day in evangelical denominations 
uh, or in Orthodox denominations and churches around the country. And that is why when you look at the Southern Baptist Convention, when you look at Catholicism, when you look at capital O Orthodoxy, when you look at uh, evangelical non-denominational churches, denominational churches around the country, you're not seeing any movement on this issue. Instead, the argument is not how do we accommodate the culture? The argument is what is the best way to present our argument back to the culture? I was just at a meeting with uh, Russell Moore at the uh, Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And as everyone knows, Southern Baptist Convention is the largest Protestant denomination in the U.S., roughly 19 million plus people affiliated. Uh, and the in question of the day wasn't how do we accommodate? The question of the day is how do we persuade about the truth of Scripture? So when you have the largest denomination in the United States, Protestant denomination, focused on changing hearts and minds to its position, it is not a time of gloom and doom, not a time of gloom and doom at all. And that, I think, is leading directly into the growth of the grassroots movement that exists against totalitarianism, against conformity in uh, the sexual arena and the diminishment of religious liberty. I mentioned, I mentioned of course, uh, Chick-fil-A. That's legendary by these points, but let's also not forget Hobby Lobby. Hobby Lobby was supposed to pay for its sin of paying for only 16 out of 20 contraceptives. It was going to have to pay for its apostasy. It did not pay for its apostasy. Instead, Hobby Lobby not only won at the Supreme Court of the United States, it won on bu uh, busily serving its customers who, by and large, uh, you know, the, I think one, maybe the second or third largest store in my uh, mule capital of the world after Walmart is a Hobby Lobby. And if you ask their customers, uh, should these folks whose store they patronize is full of Christian symbols and imagery and Christian books, including books by the founders of the company that proclaim their Christian faith, should they be forced to pay for uh, pills and devices that they believe cause abortion? Uh, they would say no, absolutely not, and, and I wouldn't want them to. So a boycott utterly failed. Now, I'll bring up this example, and, and I bring it up not because I agree with everything Phil Robertson says or how he says it, but the effort to drive a guy, I, I knew the left was beginning to lose a bit of its cultural a, a power when it lost in an effort to drive a guy off its own medium, television, a mainstream, broad, uh, a mainstream cable channel for uh, engaging in speech against homosexual activity that was pretty colorful and upfront, and they lost that battle. He's still there. He's still there to this day, even though almost I can't even open and read the Huffington Post any given week without reading about a fresh outrage from Phil Robertson, but he's still there. They lost on that. Think about this. In Texas recently, there was an effort to subpoena the contents of not just sermons, but communications with parishioners, between parishioners and pastors, about sexual issues. Unbelievably overreaching. Unbelievably overreaching. Legal organizations stampeded in to file to quash those subpoenas, but the public outrage was so great that even a radical city government in Houston capitulated maybe within 24, and I think no later than within 48 hours. So something is happening at the grassroots that is very potent and very powerful. And let's not forget Indiana. In Indiana, two of the headlines were Republicans cave, which sad to say is that, head, that's, is that Tuesday? Uh, Republicans cave on multiple, uh, on multiple conflicts frequently, as do Democrats, compromise is part of politics. But the headlines were Republicans cave Memories Pizza closes its doors. So this pizza company that had received uh, death threats, uh, an avalanche of negative Google and Yelp reviews, closes its doors and then says, we don't know when we're going to reopen. Less well covered in the, in the, in the uh, media was what happened next. Dana Lash uh, initiates and, and the folks at The Blaze initiate a GoFundMe campaign through for small dollar donations to help reopen Memories Pizza. And it raises 
before they closed it down, $850,000 in less than a week. Now, some of you guys here are involved in uh, nonprofit fundraising efforts. Uh, try raising $850,000 in small dollar donations in less than a week without a pre-existing mailing list, without a pre-existing affiliation with the organization. I mean, that's an astonishing accomplishment, astonishing. They would have kept going had they not shut it down. And Memories Pizza did what? It reopened to a packed house. So while the headline was politicians cave, the grassroots reality was Memories Pizza, this vilified organization, prevails, and now they're rich. I had no idea that small town pizza could be so lucrative. So the grassroots came through. And this brings back to reforming the, the last point that I mentioned. As the grassroots comes through, the intellectual core of conservative Christianity, of conservatism more generally, remains intact. It might be despairing in a Game of Thrones, winter is coming sort of Starkian worldview, but it remains intact. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Ross Douthat has been writing invaluable stuff at New York Times. Many people in this room have been offering their own contributions, dismayed by the drift of the culture, but not yielding on the underlying principles involved. And I would submit to you that history would show that where the grassroots remains intact and the intellectual core of our movement remain intact, the politicians will follow. Rare is the politician who's a true leader. They tend to be followers who follow their culture, the culture that they come from. A great example of this is the pro-life movement. For a very long time, we've had real difficulty making progress on life legislation. But in recent years, as the grassroots movement in the states has grown in power, we have seen much to the uh, abortion industry's chagrin, more pro-life legislation enacted, say, in the last three years than the previous 10 combined. And that's a result of politicians who are following a culture that is energized on this issue and an intellectual core that also has always been energized on this issue. So again, this sounds like I'm being optimistic. I'm just predicting stalemate. And in predicting stalemate, that strikes some people as wildly optimistic. But here's where I think we can begin to turn from stalemate into progress. As I mentioned earlier, and then I'm going to open this up for questions, uh, the reality is, particularly when the, within the religious community, that the argument, the sexual revolutionary argument, is failing is failing to appeal to people of faith. It just is. If you look at the denominations that have opened their doors, who have, who have proclaimed that they have opened their theology to a variety of beliefs and practices that defy Orthodox Christianity, they're vanishing. They are. Uh, PCUSA, one of the most, uh, and I, I just mentioned them not because of any longstanding grudge since I'm part of the PCA and, and, uh, there, we, we were split off from them. But if you compare the growth of the PCA with the losses of the PCUSA, which last year lost 5% of its total membership in more than 100 congregations in one year, with the PCA, which has had tenfold increase in the oh, last 20 years, you can see where the energy and momentum is. The mainstream media would tell you otherwise. I'll close with an example of this that we've seen in my own backyard in Tennessee. Not too far from where I live is a evangelical church called Grace Point Church. It's a church that a lot of musicians like to attend. It's Carrie Underwood's church. If you remember Carrie Underwood of, of uh, American Idol fame and Jesus Take the Wheel fame and many other great songs. I think I have four of her albums, so I'm a Carrie Underwood fan. She attends this church, and it's long been known as a gay-friendly evangelical church. Well, about uh, three, or, three months or so ago, it took the plunge and became the first big, big evangelical church in Nashville to say, we're going to recognize same-sex marriages. This was covered in Time Magazine. It was a big event. This is the crack in the wall of evangelical churches. It's a mega church in Nashville. Now, it's less than 1,000 members. That is not a mega church in Nashville. I can show you a mega church in Nashville. City blocks of just churches. But um, at the very end of the article in Time, it noticed that they had already lost almost 50% of their members in two weeks' time after announcing their embrace of same-sex marriage and almost 50% of donations. Just two weeks ago, the church, which used to have two and sometimes three services on Sunday morning, launched 
just one service called Together in This, signaling, I think, that they now believe that it's us, them against the world. That So for Christian organizations, recent history is proving the path to cultural accommodation is the path to extinction. But if you look at the list of growing or holding firm denominations in entities in the United States, it is those who are, maintain adherence to Orthodox Christianity. Granite, by definition, is strong. Limestone, by definition, is much weaker. We have borne down to the granite, and now it is time to regather our strength and try to make headway again back into the limestone. Um, with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Hello. Um, my, uh, my question for you is, uh, is actually on the very nature of religious liberty. I'm, I'm not entirely convinced that it's the right argument. I just wondered if you could fill this out. But it's, there's, a, there's almost an assumption of total state power to regulate private contracts, that the only way you can get out of that is by using sincerely held religious belief. In my mind, have we already lost the battle by accepting this dichotomy that, that, the, that the government really does? It, it occupies the public square and the private square. There is no distinction. And the only way to get out of it is through religious belief. And I was just wondering if you could comment on that. You know, I think that the religious liberty argument is a, is a good, se a nice segue into a larger discussion of who owns your business or who owns a business. One of the things that struck me about the Hobby Lobby argument was that, in fact, just what you said, the only real argument that they had available to them was the religious liberty argument under RIFRA. That was the only viable legal argument, certainly, and the one that prevailed at the Supreme Court. But it led to a larger conversation that needs to occur about who really owns the business. We have reached a point where, with, through voluminous economic regulations, health and safety regulations, public accommodation statutes, that there is almost this assumption that people have that if I'm in a, a for-profit business, I have essentially no rights if, I'm con if my desire to run my business in a particular manner con uh, conflicts with the government's desire to regulate me. And so the, I think the Hobby Lobby case was a cultural moment to begin questioning that premise. But I would agree with you. I think that it's quite distressing uh, from a just a, a liberty uh, from a liberty standpoint that the only real viable argument left of the uh, Hobby Lobby owners was that religious liberty argument. And had it not been for RIFRA, they would have had a very difficult time in court. I'd like to invite your comments on the Benedict option, and specifically, I'd be interested in uh, which legislative protections you think would need to be enacted first before the Benedict option would be feasible. Well, let me uh, let me uh, describe to you what I think the Benedict option is, so because it's kind of a new concept. Um, the Benedict option, as I understand it, is a strategic withdrawal from pop culture, culture large uh, at large retreating into your specific church organizations, retrenching and reteaching the truths of scripture and the church. And then once uh, you have re-solidified, then at, a, at an indefinite future date, you're going to sally back forth into the culture. Is, is that a fair description? Um, my problem with that, l let me, let me uh, I, I have two problems with that. One uh, tactical and one legal. Uh, or it was tactical slash strategic, also with theological elements thrown in. Number one, uh, teaching properly within churches the eternal truths of Christianity is something that should be the baseline of what we're doing already. And I think, I think it's a bit of an exaggeration to, be, uh, to believe that we're not, given the solidity of the various major denominations on these core issues. So I think that that's already occurring to a degree, a greater degree than many may perceive. Second thing is, um, if you begin to consciously adopt that Benedict option and retreating back to the church proper, I think you're inadvertently beginning to play into an argument that, is, uh, that the Obama administration and others on the left have been making, is that religious liberty is the thing you do in church. And if you retreat, retreat back to church, you're giving a cultural argument that, yes, in fact, that is where religious liberty occurs. It is in church. Uh, you know, one of the... Uh, the I think more subtle and damaging aspects of the entire debate over the HHS mandate was the extent to which, well, if you were in a church plan or the church organization, you were fine. 
move along, nothing to see here. All part of this effort to sort of redefine religious liberty as the right to worship, when religious liberty is really something much more broad. Uh, and then finally, I, I, I think, you know, that the Benedict option, in my mind, is, is inconsistent with the call to be salt and light. Uh, and there's many different ways that you can do that. There are ways subtle, ways overt. Uh, and we have many, uh, it, they're one of the more fun, and I use that uh, term sarcastically, debates in, in the larger Christian community is over which forms of Christian art are the really good forms of Christian art to really to sally forth into the culture. So you have on the one side the people who say that the very explicitly uh, explicit religious communication, like say the God, a God's not dead, that's the way to go. Others who say, no, 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 that's just so heavy-handed and nobody likes it and it's like 3% on Rotten Tomatoes. So we're going to go with the much more subtle, cool, hipster way to do it. I'm, I'm of the mindset of do it all. Do it all. Be direct, be subtle, but be salt and light. And I feel like the Benedict option, and I don't think Rod would say he doesn't want to be salt and light, but I think that one of the implications of that is a retreat is inconsistent with that salt and light imperative. So um, I want to play devil's advocate by pointing to, I think, three um, facts, if they are facts, that might undermine the optimism. And I agree we should be hopeful, but I think mm -hmm. hope is different than optimism. Now, um, and keep, keep in mind, my optimism is of a stalemate. <laughs> sure. Like, so, so here are the three, three uh, facts I would mm -hmm. raise. Uh, I think you're right that the denominations that are growing are orthodox, uh, but it's not clear to me that the members of those denominations are orthodox, that orthopraxy is actually being lived out. Um, so while it's true that, you know, the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States is good on these things, and the official teaching of the Southern Baptist Convention and of all of its members' churches are good on this, what are the actual beliefs of Southern Baptists and Roman Catholics in the United States? And what are their practices? If you look at their premarital sex rates, their divorce rates, their uh, online pornography watching rates, uh, what would those look like compared to the general population? It strikes me that the sexual revolution uh, has been much more toxic and has infiltrated even the best institutions to a much greater degree uh, than what merely citing uh, which denominations are growing and not growing and which ones have caved and which ones haven't would suggest. So, I mean, I think that's one problem. We highlighted this a couple years ago by saying that the only reason the formal legal redefinition of marriage seems plausible uh, is because so many heterosexual people already bought into that vision. Uh, the vision of marriage that says Marriage is about consenting adult romance and caregiving, and consenting adults should do whatever consenting adults want to do, has already informed the moral imaginations of many heterosexuals and many uh, conservative Christians. Uh, so that would be, okay, well, I mean, th that, that's, just, that's just fact one. Fact two is that you point to the intellectuals, and you kept citing Ross. No, no, I mean, this is, just, I mean, this is a question to challenge his thesis. This is how these things work. So, so point two would be that the only intellectual you cited was Ross Douthat. And I didn't see any intellectual in a mainstream organization, whether a newspaper or university, besides Ross Douthat and Robbie George, that defends Christian orthodoxy as true. Michael Gerson. All of, all, I don't know if he defended it as true as much as I saw a lot of religious liberty defenses. So this goes mm -hmm. back to the first question. I saw a lot of libertarians saying, well, look, Christians should be free to have their silly beliefs. I didn't see many people at major mainstream institutions saying those beliefs are true. Well, there's not many Christians in major mainstream institutions to make that point. Well, I... I don't know about that. I mean, so I mean, we could talk about that offline, but I, I, mean, I would just say there are a lot more. Uh, we saw this in Rod's blog, saying that there are Orthodox Christians at elite institutions that couldn't speak out for fear of losing tenure. Wouldn't speak out. And the last out. thing, wouldn't speak out. And the last wouldn't thing, speak say, out. You see this most concretely in the political class right now in D.C. Um, a, free, a, a party dedicated to freedom and liberty uh, will not move to defend the religious liberty of private religious schools in the District of Columbia. Uh, so all of this, when you put it together, it doesn't actually yield it. You've said three things. Number one, there's a difference between self-professed adherence to a faith and church-going members of faith. Uh, Russell Moore has done outstanding work on this, that we need to get past this notion of, oh, so for example, depending on the measure, 50% of Americans are evangelical or 40% or third. No, 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 no. What we're talking about, uh, the, the community I'm talking about is the community of church-going faith. Um, I would urge you to uh, look at some, and I, I can't cite URLs for you right now, but Russell Moore and his team at ERLC have done a really good job showing that the distinction in America is not between professions of identity, I'm an evangelical or I'm not an e evangelical, it's between those who, people who are church-going and not church-going. And church-going evangelicals divorce a heck of a lot less, 
uh, engage their their behavior on every major element that you brought up is significantly different from the culture at large. So when I talk about that, I'm talking about the church going public, which is still millions upon millions strong. And as much dissent as there is, and there is still there is certainly dissent within in any orthodox denomination. There is a more dissent right now in the main line, as the churches are peeling off every single time they make another step down the road of the sexual revolution. And that's covered much less. So whereas Grace Point makes Time Magazine, how many of the 100 plus PCUSA churches that left the PCUSA in 2013 made Time Magazine? That's not a story. But it is a story that one moderately sized evangelical church. That was point one. Number two, number two was, yes. I, you know, what, what I would say is, I can't think of a single significant public intellectual that is a orthodox, small, low Christian who has, while there might be some who've changed their minds about the legality of whether gay marriage should be represented, uh, should be uh, protected legally or not, who've changed their mind on the under underlying theological position that same-sex behavior is, is immoral. It's, you know, I can think of uh, a Rob Bell or a Brian McLaren, but respectfully, they don't count as leading conservative or orthodox uh, thinkers. So I would say there's a paucity of them in the New York Times. There's a paucity in the Washington Post. Um, but I, that's honestly not where the orthodox community gets its news or its ideas, uh, by and large. And then, uh, man, I feel like I'm Rick Perry magnified. The third one? Oh, right. Now, in that point, I'm going to agree with you. Um, it is very, and, and this, this isn't just the religious liberty point. I mean, we had the House failed to pass a 20-week abortion ban, giving the, uh, the abortion industry a victory on the day of the March for Life. I mean, you're not going to find in me now, and I'm going to say, I don't want to cast as a class Republicans in this way. There are members of staffs and, and individual congressmen and senators who are doing great work. No question. But there are also many others who lag on that. I mean, I, and one thing I'm going to have to agree with Rod Dreyer on is he called um, governor of Arkansas Republican Walmart, um, that there is uh, an enormous influence from corporations that are uh, opposed, who have taken one side in the culture wars. And so I don't have a lot of short-term optimism politically. I have long-term optimism, and I use as an example for that the battle for life. And even though we stumble here and there, Bottom line is, in the last three years, more pro-life legislation than in the last 10 combined. So that's, that's very positive. Yes, Brian. David, I hear you um, encouraging us to sort of move the, the locus from a small, particular battle to a much larger mm -hmm. front, um, gospel versus the revolution. Dive bombing Indiana, Indiana, there's organizations, lots of businesses, churches on our side. What's the, what's the approach to that? Is it roughly more troops involved in the church on the side? Is it more political? Is it stopping the guy from knocking down the guy on his bike? Is it, it's just, it's, how much are those towers of strength? Well, I mean, I think we have towers of strength outside the Beltway. So, for example, um, just to think of um, Beckett Fund, ADF, I mean, ADF is a $50 million organization. Uh, Beckett Fund, I don't know its budget, but. Uh, it's tough, top to bottom with lawyers who just, just, they just win at the Supreme Court is what they do lately. Um, so, you know, we have institutions that are very, very powerful. Our institutions, though, are communicating to different audiences. So, you know, the Alliance Defense Fund or uh, Comparable, they're not going to receive the same kind of attention from the mainstream media except in a negative way that the human rights campaign will be or will receive. And so it creates, I think, a false impression that if you're just parachuting in and glancing at the media as to the strength of the respective sides. I think you get a more accurate perception of the strength when you begin to look at more objective measures, like, for example, that all, you know, almost a million dollars for this little pizza company. I mean, that's, that's an objective thing that occurred that isn't sort of a pop culture uh, 
just sort of a subjective sense of who won or lost a day of political debate. That's, an, that's real dollars and cents. So um, I don't deny their strength in the mainstream media. I don't deny the strength of their institutions. And, and all of those budgets are magnified many times in their power by the sympathy of, say, a New York Times, or the Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, Inbe you know, the whole the list goes on. But we have strength as well, and that strength is one real significant victory. So I'll give you uh, another example, I think, of where we've actually begun to see some movement and some retreat in areas where the left has felt at its strongest, and that is in higher education. Um, the California state system has excluded InterVarsity and a number of other groups from campus. This is the heart of Deep Blue California. And if you look at the coverage of that, inst of that decision for the past year, it has been far more negative than positive towards Cal State. And there's some possibility and hope that there can be some positive outcomes there as a result of that. Um, the situation at Gordon College, when it first began, uh, first endured its wave of persecution. Well, I hate to use the word persecution, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, it's wave of negative publicity and actions in, in uh, uh, Massachusetts was very isolated and alone. As it became known what was happening to Gordon, there's been significant support for the institution, including, and to be fair to Republicans, from the Hill. And that support is, uh, I believe, bearing good fruit in its own battle. So there are instances where even in the heartland of the heart of the left, the higher education, there's some reason for some optimism that we are making some progress. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you guys. <laughs>